we're here to talk about two books that force us to look at new ways in wars that most of us have thought we understood and knew about. Um, both, in a sense, are books about cover-up, about hard truths about America's wars, which were variously censored, buried in archives, censored, self-censored by the participants, and forgotten uh, aspects of war that are difficult to look at. Um, in the case of my colleague uh, Dale Maharaj, uh, his book, Bringing Mulligan Home, uh, follows, as he'll tell you, his father's life as a U.S. Marine in World War II. Now, growing up when I did, I thought I kind of understood World War II and what it's about. But the journey that Dale took in his father's footsteps, uh, in the footsteps of other soldiers in his unit, in the footsteps of Japanese civilians on Okinawa and elsewhere, gives us a very different picture of that war. Dale is my colleague here at the Graduate School of Journalism where he's been teaching since 2001. Before that, he was a visiting professor at Stanford University for 10 years and spent 15 years in newspapers. Several of his books are illustrated with the work of the photographer Michael S. Williamson. His first book, Journey to Nowhere, the saga of the new underclass, going all the way back to 1985, later inspired Bruce Springsteen to write two songs. It was reissued in 1996 with an introduction by Springsteen. His second book, And Their Children After Them, won the Pulitzer Prize for Nonfiction in 1990. Uh, Nick Terse, on my immediate right, uh, is the author of The Complex, and most recently, Kill Everything That Moves, The Real American War in Vietnam. He's managing editor for TomDispatch.com, a news site that follows very much in the tradition and steps of, of IF Stone's Weekly, for people of a certain generation, and a fellow at the Nation Institute, the nonprofit affiliate of The Nation magazine. His work has appeared in Los Angeles Times, The San Francisco Chronicle, and The Nation, among other publications. His investigations of American war crimes in Vietnam, Vietnam have gained him a Ridenauer Prize for repertorial distinction, a Guggenheim Fellowship, and a fellowship at Harvard University's Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study. Um, Nick's book, uh, which I should have said at the intro, at the beginning of yours, begins with an accidental encounter when he's a graduate student here at Columbia University, an accidental encounter with a trove of documents which lead him to the kind of understanding of Vietnam and of the war in Vietnam that, that um, I think forces all of us to reassess what we know. I certainly know growing up when I did, I thought I understood Vietnam and understood it as a series of political mistakes and understood what was wrong with that war. His book goes far deeper and exposes a kind of systematic brutality um, that ha already has historians uh, arguing about whether we understand the war as we should. A quick road map. Uh, I'm going to ask Dale and then Nick each to talk about their books a little bit, um, tell us a little bit about how they put them together, show us a few slides, read them, read from them, whatever they intend to do. Then we'll have a little bit of a back and forth and then a conversation with all of you. I hope all of you in the room will, will participate. When you do, uh, please, and I'll tell you about this later, come up to the microphone and tell us who you are and remember that this is being videotaped not only for C-SPAN but for the DART Center's website, so don't embarrass yourself too much. Um, also, please do what I'm going to do now, which is put your cell phone on, on silent um, so that the conversation can go on uninterrupted. Um, with that, I think, Dale, let's begin with you since World War II comes historically <laughs> first, um, and, and you have kind of a, a personal journey that leads you to this bigger story. I'm going to start off with showing you a video, uh, two guys from my dad's unit talking. It's one of the many discoveries about the war that I did not know when I started my journey. So let's go right into this. One of the myths of World War II is that the Japanese never surrendered. For sure, the Bushido War Code prevented surrender for many, but many others tried to surrender, and they were killed by the Americans. At the end of their lives, the memory of prisoners being killed haunted some of the men in my father's U.S. Marine unit. It's just one of the aftermaths of World War II that these men had to live with their entire lives that I found in my 12 years of research for this book. 
Charles LePant vividly remembers being told not to take prisoners on the eve of the Battle of Guam. Colonel Schiffler, he said when we was on the ship before we went into Guam, the last thing he said, don't be taken prisoner, and I don't want any prisoners. And that was his exact words, and they didn't take any. They had a prisoner they captured as we were moving later on a couple of days on Guam and they brought him up to the Colonel Schistler and Colonel Schistler remember this day saying what you bring him to me for I don't want him and he said he's yours you know take him and I know they made him run down the road and somebody shot him Mr. LePan told me that he couldn't ever kill a prisoner, but Frank Palmasani had no regrets about what happened to a Japanese lieutenant who surrendered. They had a lieutenant that uh, surrendered there. He graduated from Stanford University in California. He could speak better English than me. Well, the first thing he asked me for is a Lucky Strike cigarette. So I said, you want a lucky strike, huh? I said, I'm going to give you one. And I stuck the bayonet right in his neck and killed him. You didn't take any prisoners on Guam, did you? No, none at all. So in the Pacific, there was a policy pretty much of no prisoners. And as near as I can tell, the records are, as Nick found when he did his research, you can't really find these records. They've all vanished that documented officially. But the numbers tell the story, I believe. So anyway, that's just one discovery of, of many. Um, I grew up with this picture uh, in, my father, in the basement. My father was a tool and cutter grinder. Uh, he, he worked for Cleveland Twist Drill, which was the premier industrial tool cutting company in America at the time. And he had a business in his basement at night where he ground tools. So he worked like 15, 16 hours a day, very blue collar kind of guy. And he, this was right station next to his workstation. And so I grew up with this picture. Never talked about it except once when I was 12 years old, when he was on meds. A drunk driver nearly killed him. And he's got emotional as I've ever seen him. I didn't kill him, but they blame me. And he never talked about the picture again. This picture of my dad grinding in our basement. Or actually, this is in the back. The shop had opened by 19, 1980. I took his picture of him in 19, 1983. Dad had a lot of anger. We grew up in a house of bedlam. Uh, one of his kids uh, would spill a glass of water at the dinner table, forget to put the top back on the ketchup, he'd pick it up, it'd come out. He would just explode in these amazing rages. At the same time, he was, most of the time, was a great guy. By the age of 10 or so, 11, I knew it was connected to the war somehow. It was just because when he talked about the war in those brief times, that's when I would see rage emerge and this, this personality come out. But it was only fragments of the war that I heard. A little backstory in my dad. He grew up in the south side of Cleveland. This is my grandma, who never learned how to speak English. She was a Russian speaker. Looks like a Russian peasant. Uh, this is the front yard of their house, looking down the street in Cleveland towards uh, Star, uh, uh, St. Theodosius. If you've seen the movie The Deer Hunter by Michael Cimino, that's the church where the wedding scene takes place. And that part of the movie is more documentary than it is fiction. Uh, that's how that, that was, that's my people. <laughs> So that's kind of the backstory where he was from. This is where he, when he got out of boot camp. Now, the myth of World War II also is, and I knew this from my dad himself, is that everyone was, rah, well, we're gonna go fight. My dad ignored three draft notices. After when the police came looking for him, he said, okay, I'll join the Marines. And he said, I didn't join the Navy because he had to wear those bell-bottom pants and I didn't like them. And I don't know if he was joking. My dad had a sense of humor. If he, if he wasn't joking, he wasn't very smart about that move. Um, anyway, uh, he gets sent to uh, uh, Guadalcanal. This is to him taken on the jungles of Guadalcanal. He was in the Battle of Guam, where he was uh, grievously injured. A, some of those Japanese soldiers I sh that were in the video, that's from a picture of a, of a company, a Japanese company that Charles LePan found just beyond where my dad was injured. So those are very lucky that one of those guys may have fired the mortar that nearly killed my dad. Uh, one of the guys I found told me that all the men were dead around my father in the foxholes, and he was almost bled out in the morning. So they patched him up and put him back in for Okinawa. You didn't get sent home from that war. You, you went back unless you'd lost your legs. He came home, and I got this from him. He was drunk for four years. He ran a numbers operation on the south side of Cleveland. 
involved in a few minor crimes. They documented everything. I don't know why. This is my dad passed out on the lawn. Why they did that, I don't know. Then he met my mom. Now, she's my mom, so I can't comment on how she looks, but I'm told she was an attractive woman. So he kind of cleaned up his act at that point. Uh, and he kind of he buckled down, and, and uh, we came along. But yet, my mom's told me that for about a year he was great. And then these raging eruptions would happen. And she merely thought he was crazy. She had no sense of why. Um, I later found out from my research that my father suffered two major blast concussion injuries. And blast concussion forever alters your brain. We're learning that with football players now and of course the soldiers coming back from today's wars. There's things called axons in your, in your brain. And the scientists tell me that's like silly putty. If you pull it slowly, they're, they're fine. But if you have a blast, they snap. They wither, atrophy, and Dr. Smith at Penn told me that my father's behavior pff, typical of, of blast concussion. So that was, but we didn't know that growing up. This is me, okay, and this is not an antique car. This is what the cars looked like then. So I, I'll, I'll, when I get up, I'll, I'll go away in my cane. I'm that old. <laughs> um, and uh, we were a typical American family, post-war family. Dad built the house, suburbs of Cleveland. That's my mom, my sister, and I. And from the exterior, it looked normal. But behind the scenes, it was dark. Me, I'm a happy kid. But as I got older, I became this brooding loner because these raging eruptions just affected our house. And it affects me to this day, actually. Uh, uh, at the same time, though, my dad was this great guy. He took us fishing. 80% of the time, he was the guy you want to have a beer with. Um, so I still love my dad. But he dies in 2000. We bury him in Arlington National Cemetery. And I decided, it was two days after he died, I've got to find out about his war. I've got to find out about that man in the picture. And I began my quest. And so there was a Japanese flag my father had in his drawer. 22 American uh, soldiers' names are on it. Started with those guys. I ended up getting the muster rolls for the Battle of Okinawa, 400 names. You do not, cannot imagine how many Robert Harrisons and Angus Robertsons I called alone. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of phone calls. I sent hundreds of letters out to people without uh, uh, phones trying to find out who I could find. In the end, I found 29 after 12 years. And I was still looking for them up to the day I published the book. I, I, it's actually just names I did not call. I ran out of time. Um, Fenton Grainer was one of the guys I found. From Fenton, I learned about my father's first blast concussion. He, too, had a blast concussion on the Battle of Sugarloaf Hill in Okinawa. Um, a lot of the guys did not like how the war was fought. They re read later that General MacArthur, Douglas MacArthur said, don't invade Iwo Jima, don't invade Okinawa. Go around them. Hit them where they ain't was his motto. Where Nimitz was more every island. We just pounded through the Japanese. Um, and they were bitter, some of them, about how they were treated or mistreated. They witnessed atrocities. Fenton Grainert told me, and I'd heard about from my father, the rapist in the company. There was a psychopath in the company who raped a woman, and he killed two babies, point blank. Fenton Grainer tried to stop him, and he threatened to shoot Fenton if he tried to stop him. Fenton Grainer, 65 years after the babies were murdered, was weeping like a baby as he told me this story. Um, still affected him. You, know, you, you don't get over something like that. Um, there was Jim Lockridge, who I really like, despite the fact that he confessed to me about the atrocities he committed. He ripped the gold teeth from Japanese cadavers' mouths. He told me I would, it got so I would shoot Japanese in the stomach so they would suffer longer. Um, and he was, he was bitter about the experience. But rep, 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 he was repentant because he realizes, he says, the, guy, the man's dead, let him be. So it is, it is, he's, as he was in his dying days, he, he basically regretted everything he had done in the war. Uh, his daughter I just talked to about a month ago, Melody Simmons, told me, uh, you came at a good time. You helped him get the poison out of his system. But he never got over the war. And then, Finally, I went to Japan, and I wanted to see where things happened. My father had objects, passports, and uh, items with names on them of soldiers I believed that he had killed. I went to meet the families. It's a long story, too long for the little bit of time I have here. But the one thing I will say is I met Mrs. Onishi in my quest. She fled my father's company as they were going down the island. When she left the city of Naha, there were 16 family members. Two weeks later, 13 of them were dead. None of them were shot at my dad's company. They don't want to kill civilians, except for that psychopath. Naval bombs and shells 
150,000 civilians died in that battle that MacArthur said didn't have to happen. 150,000. When you had the Japanese soldiers and American soldiers, a quarter of a million people died on Okinawa. That's more than both atomic bombs that hit Japan. Stunning casualty rate for a battle that may not have had, because basically the, they were cut off by air and sea. And MacArthur's, go around them. It's an island. They can't, they can't go anywhere. So that was some of the discuss, discoveries of my father's war. We'll talk more about it as we get into the discussion. Uh, let's turn it over to you, Nick. Uh, and Nick, I mean, Dale began with the most intimate experience, and that led him down the road of documents and interviews and so on. You came in the other way, sort of. You came in through a box of documents. That's right. That's right. Uh, my presentation is decidedly lower tech. I'm going to uh, uh, read a, a selection from my book. You know, I began this project uh, as a study of war crimes, but along the way, it became a, a history of Vietnamese civilian suffering. So I'm going to read you a, a selection about the beginnings of the project and how my journey in this book took shape. I stumbled upon the first clues to this hidden history almost by accident in June 2001 when I was a graduate student researching post-traumatic stress disorder among Vietnam veterans. One afternoon, I was looking through documents at the U.S. National Archives when a friendly archivist asked me, could witnessing war crimes cause post-traumatic stress? I had no idea at the time that the archives might have any records on Vietnam era war crimes, so the prospect never dawned on me. Within an hour or so, though, I held in my hands the yellowing records of the Vietnam War Crimes Working Group, a secret Pentagon task force that had been assembled after the My Lai Massacre to ensure that the Army would never again be caught off guard by a major war crime scandal. In hundreds of incident summaries and sworn statements, veterans laid bare what had occurred in the backlands of rural Vietnam, the war that Americans back home didn't see nightly on their televisions or read about over morning coffee. A sergeant told investigators how he put a bullet point blank into the brain of an unarmed boy after gunning down the youngster's brother. An army ranger matter-of-factly described slicing the ears off dead Vietnamese and said he planned to continue mutilating corpses. Other files documented the killing of farmers in their fields and the rape of a child carried out by an interrogator at an army base. Reading case after case, like the, like the incident in which a lieutenant, quote, captured two unarmed and unidentified Vietnamese males, estimated ages two to three and seven to eight years, and killed them for no reason. I began to get a sense of the ubiquity of atrocity during the American War. In the years that followed with the War Crimes Working Group documents as an initial guide, I began to track down more information about little known or never revealed Vietnam War Crimes. I located other investigation files at the National Archives submitted requests under the Freedom Information Act, interviewed generals and top civilian officials, and talked to former war crimes investigators. I also spoke with veterans all across the country, both those who had witnessed atrocities and others who personally committed terrible acts. From then I learned something of what it was like to be 20 years old with few life experiences beyond adolescence in a small town or inner city neighborhood and to be suddenly thrust into villages of thatch and bamboo homes that seemed ripped straight from the pages of National Geographic. Veteran after veteran told me about days of shattering fatigue and the confusion of contradictory orders, about being placed in situations so alien and unnerving that even with their automatic rifles and grenades, they felt scared walking through hamlets of unarmed women and children. My conversations with the veterans gave nuance to my understanding of the war bringing human emotion to the sometimes dry language of military records and added context to the investigation files that often focused on a single incident. These men also repeatedly showed me just how incomplete the archives I'd come upon really were, even though the files detailed hundreds of atrocity allegations. In one case, for instance, I called a veteran seeking more information about a sexual assault carried out by members of his unit, which I found mentioned in one of the files. He offered me more details about, about that particular incident, but also said it was no anomaly. Men from his unit had raped numerous other women as well, he told me, but neither those assaults nor the random shootings of farmers by his fellow soldiers 
had ever been formally investigated. Over time, following leads from the veterans I'd spoken to and from other sources, I discovered additional long forgotten court martial records, investigation files, and related documents in assorted archives and sometimes private homes across the country. Paging through one of these case files, I found myself virtually inhaling decades old dust from half a world away. The year was 1970, and a small U.S. Army patrol had set up an ambush in a jungle near the Minton rubber plantation in Binlong province, north of Saigon. Almost immediately, the soldiers heard chopping noises, then branches snapping and Vietnamese voices coming toward them. Next, a man broke through the, br the brush. He was in uniform, they would later say, as was the entire group of Vietnamese falling behind him. In an instant, the Americans sprang the ambush, setting off two Claymore mines, each sending 700 small steel pellets flying more than 150 feet in a lethal 60-degree arc and firing an M60 machine gun. All but one of the Vietnamese in the clearing were killed instantly. The unit's radio man immediately got on his field telephone and called in 10 enemy killed in action. Later, however, something didn't ring right at headquarters. Despite the claim of 10 enemy dead, the Americans had no weapons to show for it. With the My Lai massacre trials garnering headlines back in the United States, the commanding general of the 25th Infantry Division did something unusual. He asked the division's office of the inspector general, whose job it was to probe instances of alleged misconduct to investigate. The next day, a lieutenant colonel and his team arrived at the site of the ambush, where they found the corpses of five men, three women, and two children scattered on the forest floor. None was wearing uniforms, and civilian identification cards were found on the bodies. The closest thing to a weapon was a small piece of paper with, quote, a small drawing of a rifle in an airplane. The soldiers who sprang the ambush claimed it was evidence that the dead were enemy fighters, but the lieutenant colonel noted that it looked like something a child would do. Similarly, the makings of booby traps found in the bodies and cited by the soldiers as evidence of hostile intent turned out to be a harmless agricultural tool. As the American investigators photographed the corpses, it was apparent that the Vietnamese had been civilians carrying bags of bamboo shoots and a couple handfuls of limes. Regular people simply trying to eke out an existence in a war-ravaged landscape. The lime gatherers' deaths were typical of the type of operation that repeatedly wiped out civilians during the Vietnam War. Most of the time, the non-combatants who died were not herded into a ditch and gunned down as at My Lai. Instead, the full range of the American arsenal from M16 rifles and Claymore mines to grenades, bombs, mortars, rockets, napalm, and artillery shells was unleashed on forested areas, villages, and homes where perfectly ordinary Vietnamese just happened to live and work. As the Inspector General's report concluded in this particular incident, the Vietnamese victims were innocent civilians loyal to the Republic of Vietnam. Yet, as so often happened, no disciplinary action of any type was taken against any member of the unit. In fact, their battalion commander stated that the team performed exactly as he expected them to. The battalion's operations officer explained that the civilians had been in an off-limits or free fire zone, one of the many swaths of the country where everyone was assumed to be the enemy. Therefore, the soldiers had behaved in accordance with the U.S. military's directives on the use of lethal force. It made no difference that the lime gatherers happened to live there, as their ancestors undoubtedly had for decades, if not centuries before. It made no difference that as the local province chief of the U.S. allied South Vietnamese government told the army, the civilians in the area were poor, uneducated, and went wherever they could to get food. The inspector general's report pointed out that there was no written documentation regarding the establishment of a free fire zone in the area, noting with bureaucratic understatement that doubt exists that the program to warn Vietnamese civilians about off-limits areas was either effective or thorough, but that too made no difference. As the final investigation report put it, the platoon had operated, quote, within its orders, which had been given or sanctioned by competent authority. The rules of engagement were not violated. Seeking to connect such formal military records with the actual experience of ordinary Vietnamese people who lived through these events, I made several trips to Vietnam, making my way to remote rural villages with an interpreter at my side. The jigsaw puzzle pieces were not always easy to align, 
in the files of the War Crimes Working Group, for example, I located an exceptionally detailed investigation of a massacre of nearly 20 women and children by a U.S. Army unit in a tiny hamlet in Guangdong province on February 8, 1968. It was clear that the ranking officer there had ordered his men to, quote, kill anything that moves, and that some of the soldiers had obeyed. What was less clear was exactly where there was. With only a general location to go by, 15 miles west of an old port town known as Hoi An, we embarked on a shoe leather search. Inquiries with locals led us to An Trung, a small hamlet with a monument to a 1968 massacre. But this particular mass killing took place on January 9, 1968, rather than in February, and was carried out by South Korean forces allied to the Americans, rather than by U.S. soldiers themselves. It wasn't the place we were looking for. After we explained the situation, one of the residents led us to another village not very far away. It too had a memorial, this one commemorating 33 locals who died in three separate massacres between 1967 and 1970. However, none of these massacres had taken place on February 8, 1968 either. After interviewing villagers about these atrocities, we asked if they knew any other mass killings in the area. Yes, they said, not the next hamlet down the road, but a little beyond it. So on we went. Daylight was rapidly fading when we arrived in that hamlet and found a monument that spelled out the basics of, a, of the grim story in spare details. U.S. troops had killed dozens of Vietnamese there in 1968. Conversations with the farmers made it clear, though, that these Americans were Marines, not Army soldiers. And the massacre had taken place in August. Such is the nature of investigating war crimes in Vietnam. I thought that I was looking for a needle in a haystack. What I found was a veritable haystack of needles. Thanks. Um, both of you, as you went about this sort of epic research, um, had, had the experience, had the necessity, both of confronting US military veterans with things they had done a long time ago, talking to them about it, and also talking with Vietnamese civilians, one of whom I guess is uh, in that photo up there, one of the folks you spoke with. How did that go? How, how did each of you kind of win the trust of your subjects, build bridges to events that people often would prefer not to remember or haven't had a whole lot of ratification for? Dale, how did that go for you? There's a range from easy to extremely difficult. Um, I worked my way down the list that I showed you to a Joseph P. Rossblock, who was age appropriate. And I called, and I just called the week before and got a hold of a widow whose husband had died 20 years earlier, but the name was still in his, and she was weeping. So it was very difficult. So I, I called Mr. Rossblock, and I said, is this the Mr. Rossblock who was on Okinawa? And he said, what do you want him for? He was angry and hostile. And I splurted while my father, this tomb blew up, uh, the second blast concussion was when Herman Mulligan, the man I told you, showed you in the picture, he threw a, a, a grenade into a Japanese tomb where there had been machine gunners on a hill, and it had one ton of munitions in it, they estimate. It went like a volcano. And it, that's what killed Mr. Mulligan. Um, and he, Ross Black, there was a pause, and he said, I was there. And he didn't want to talk. It was a tenuous conversation. Uh, he agreed, I send you a picture, I, I want you to help identify Mr. Mulligan. It turns out he carried Mr. Mulligan's body. So two weeks later I called him and he just motor mouthed for an hour about the difficulty of the blast concussion. He was in the hospital for six months. He said, I never, sometimes I wish I would have died. I never came back. Very difficult life. On and on and on about the war. And at the end of the, about maybe an hour, it was just went on, he said, you're the first person I've ever talked to the war about with ever. So it was that kind of a, uh, and I think the reason that these guys talked to me, partly near the end of their lives, something about hitting your 80s, nearing your 80s and hitting your 80s, uh, I think people get confessional. Number two, I was the son of one of these guys. And I think they felt, I mean, I, I at least understood some of the issues they went through. So I think that helped in my case. Yeah. Nick, how, how did those kinds of encounters go for you and how did you, how did you approach them? It's one thing to, to find these stories on the cold page in a box of documents and another thing to bring someone up or show up in their living room and talk about it. 
Yeah, I mean, I had responses uh, across the spectrum as well. Uh, you know, generally, I was, I was, I, in, in all cases, I was up front, uh, you know, and, and a lot of these guys knew what I'd, I'd come to talk about because I told them, you know, I found these records, uh, you know, that, uh, about war crimes allegations in your unit. Uh, so I, I told them right off the bat, sometimes the phone would get slammed down or the door would be slammed shut in my face. But you know, generally, I found veterans willing to talk as long as I could, you know, get my foot in the door and get them talking. Once I showed that I had, uh, you know, a knowledge of the war, I knew something ab about what their service was really like, what they'd been through. Uh, many times they were willing to, to open up. Uh, you know, I, I, I think back to one marathon phone call that I had uh, with a veteran. And uh, I, I knew a lot about his unit from the records. And we talked for four and a half, five hours. And he told me, you know, that the, I, I, and I could tell, and this is often the case, they'd say that, that Vietnam was the high point of their lives. And he told me about all these great times, uh, just, you know, fantastic times with the, the closest friends he ever had. Uh, and he had a, a really infectious laugh, booming laugh. And we, we talked for a long time about this. And then, you know, he got quiet and he said, you know, I need to tell you a story. And he told me about one of the times his unit went into a village and they were setting it on fire. This was standard operating procedure. This was how they tried to, to break the, uh, the ties between the Vietnamese population and the, and the guerrillas. So they're, they're burning the village down. He said uh, a woman came running out of one of the homes and started grabbing a, 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 this GI on, the, on his sleeve and chattering at him. And he said the, the GI just pushed her away. And she came back again, and he took the butt of his rifle and hit her squarely in the, the face, broke her nose. There was blood everywhere. She was screaming, and he said that this soldier from his unit just turned around and walked away laughing. And you know, he, he paused for a beat, and then he said, you, you know that the soldier I'm talking about is me. You know, I had, uh, I had a real tough time matching up the man that I was talking to, to his 19-year-old self. And he told me he had the same problem, that he couldn't imagine how he had done that. Uh, he said at the time he didn't think anything of it, but in the years since, he couldn't stop thinking of it. He blocked out lots of, of what he did. He said that he thought he'd done worse things in the war, but this was something that had lodged in his mind. It, it kind of became a placeholder memory. But he said that he was, he was glad to get it out there because you know, he, he, uh, he'd been carrying around these memories and. He said it, it, was, it was helpful for him to finally talk to someone who understood what his unit had been through and what they did in Vietnam. And, and this, more often than not, that was the case. And, and tell us about the gentleman in the photo and, and what those kind of conversations were like. Uh, this, this photo was taken by uh, uh, my wife, photojournalist uh, Tam Terse. This was a, a village in uh, uh, Binh Dinh province, uh, uh, one of the provinces across uh, along the coast of the South China Sea. And this village was particularly hard hit. Uh, he lost uh, several family members to a, a bunker collapse, a bomb shelter collapse. Uh, his family had, had crowded into one of these bunkers, and I believe he was still out in the fields working. Uh, generally, he tried to, to run for it, but he wasn't able to get there in time. And on that particular day, an artillery shell landed directly on the bunker and, and, and killed everyone inside. This happened again and again in this, this village. And uh, you know, I, I would go through uh, uh, this, this particular woman, Pham T. Cook. She was uh, from the village that I, I mentioned in my reading where there were three massacres between 1967 and 1970. Uh, again, a particularly hard hit village. I went uh, to these villages and you know, I asked people to dredge up the most uh, horrific uh, events of their lives, the most uh, you know, traumatic experiences you can imagine. And afterwards, uh, it, it, I was always taken aback because I would be thanked. Uh, you know, the, the Vietnamese that I talked to were uh, amazed that there was some American who knew something about their, their village uh, who knew something about their experience during the war, and they couldn't believe that someone had traveled halfway around the world to actually uh, hear it and, and was interested in, in trying to, to tell it. Uh, 
uh, it was it was always uh, exceptionally humbling for me, and uh, it was uh, you know, the, the most uh, you know the, the most emotional and and, uh, and affecting uh, reporting experiences I've ever had. Both of you. We were talking over lunch yesterday uh, about the kind of writer's choices that these two different books about two different wars involve. And in particular, because you're describing horrific events that happen to soldiers and horrific atrocities that soldiers commit, real challenges in how you engage a reader in this process without either sensationalizing or, or alienating. Dale, how did you... You know, you're assembling all this information, some about your father, some about his comrades, some about the one psychopath in the unit, some about victims. How did you decide to put it together, and how in particular did you deal with the question of horror and the question of, of gruesome detail and ha ha trauma, and how, how did you decide to present, you can present put, it? You, know, you could put dozens of incidents in a book, and it becomes overwhelming. At, at some point, you have to pick and choose. And so I didn't put in dozens of incidents um, on all levels, not just what the, 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 what the soldiers went through, these men went through. And it, uh, I, I have tw there's 12 Marines that I quote in the book. I call that section 12 Marines, and each has their own story. Of course, each has their own war. Nobody has the same war. Um, but I, I, I kind of emphasize with each person, I, but I couldn't put in atrocity after atrocity or, or bad experience after bad experience because at some point you, you overwhelm. But, on a very personal level, my father, you know, when you're writing a memoir, it's partly a memoir, even though I don't call it that, it's called that on the cover, but I guess it is a memoir. Uh, my father was a great guy, and I still love my father. As a matter of fact, after doing this research, I, I, I was amazing he was as normal as he was after what he went through. Uh, but I put in a couple scenes of him showing his rage, and I put in one scene of us when he took us, me and my brother, fishing. And it was a magical weekend trip and very special in my memory. Um, and he was just trying to be this great dad. It was a very hard thing for him to do, I realize now, to get over this and be that dad. Um, and so, but I can't put in 15 scenes of my dad being great. So I had to pick and choose. Um, but in all my writing, and I write about some depressing things, I always look for hope and redemption. And uh, I end the book with where Mulligan died, the tomb where it blew up, it's still, half of it is still blown up. And I went there every night for two weeks. Every, after doing work all day, I would walk the two kilometers to this, mm -hmm. to this tomb site. And the last day I went there, I witnessed a Japanese, former Japanese soldier doing a ceremony where his buddy had died, putting incense out, a very Buddhist way to do things. And I was gonna imitate the ceremony. So I show up at the tomb and there's a man named Junichi there who was caretaking one of the neighbor t neighboring tombs. And then he says, he spoke a little bit of English. He says, I will pray with you. And we had this ceremony marking the death of Mulligan, and really the, the culmination of all my research. And he hugs me and thanks me at the end. And he was old enough, he'd been through the war, and over and over and over the Okinawans. And Americans don't really talk to the Japanese about the war, even now after decades. And they were appreciative that I was there and I was treated so kindly. And, so anyway, there's a lot of uplift, even though I was dealing with a lot of horror. Nick, you're a historian. You're, you're trying to get it right. You're trying to get the record right. And yet, you're also trying to write a book people will read, and it's not just a catalog of horrors. How, how did you approach this, assembling the pieces and this, once you had it? It was, it was very difficult, the same, same types of choices, of course. Uh, you know, my book is focused on civilian suffering and, and atrocities, but there is, uh, you know, and, uh, very much the same. Yeah, having to, to pick and choose, and I was I was lucky to have uh, some very skilled editors who, who reined me in. You know, I, I felt that I did need to marshal uh, a, a lot of evidence because I know there's there are a lot of people who are just going to uh, uh, they, they won't believe this. These are, are very hard truths, and uh, it's it's not the uh, the dominant narrative of the history of the Vietnam War, and it's not a popular history. So I knew I had to, to marshal the evidence, and it had to be there, but uh, you know, it, it, at some level, there's, there's just one massacre too much. Just can't have it. And you know, it, it was, uh, they were very difficult decisions, because as I mentioned, I, I keep going into one Vietnamese village after another, and I talk to these people about the most traumatic days of their lives, and I ask them, uh, 
you know, again and again, four or five times, trying to make sure that I had every detail right and having them walk me through this. Uh, so I, I felt that I owed it to them in, in a lot of ways, that, uh, that I, I needed to get their stories in there. They'd, uh, they'd walked that hard road with me and I, and I uh, owed it to them to tell their stories. And uh, eventually, I came to the realization that certain stories would have to stand in for others, that to tell the, the, the larger story of the war, that I would have to call down uh, you know, the, the, the many uh, smaller stories that I had. Each of you also, and I'm going to ask one other thing, and then maybe we'll, we'll put it to the room, but each of you also had encounters with a pretty wide range of, of soldiers who had done bad things. Um, did those encounters, has your understanding of how atrocity in war happens and its consequences changed? as you've worked on these books. Dale, what are your thoughts on that? Well, when you put guys in a situation where you don't have accommodations for prisoners, you're gonna have prisoners killed. And so, and I think of what Jim Lockridge told me. He says, when you live like a damn animal, you're gonna act like a damn animal. And that, that quote stuck with me about how, you know, you, you're, that, that battle of Okinawa went on for three, almost three months. They, they thought it'd be over in, in a third of the time. They missed, uh, intelligence was bad. They, they didn't know what they were dealing with. And, you know, it was, it was you know, you get in those situations and one never knows what they're gonna do. And I think some people break I th and, and they do things like the fellow Nick talked about and then you live with, with it with the rest of your life. So. I wasn't judgmental at all. In but, but you also my, then, you did have an encounter with the man you call Mr. Kennedy, who was the rapist and child murderer you described. How do you understand him? He's the only guy I hate out of the whole company. <laughs> they all hate him and I hate him. Uh, my, I grew up, my dad talking about this fella. And my dad, you know, he abhorred the rape. Kennedy came from here in New York City, from Park Avenue, from money. And my dad wanted money, and he had this weird, he would talk about Kennedy's money, but hate him at the same time. Well, I finally tracked down Mr. Kennedy, uh, uh, and I was, actually I was avoiding, I, I had, it was a common name, I, it's the only name I changed in the book. And I, I found him, and I called, and he said, I said, Mr. Kennedy was in Okinawa. And I said my name, and he said, Steve, my father's name, five nines, I was talking about my dad. Like, saw him yesterday. Then suddenly, who are you? Why'd you call? And I, we, we buried my mom and my dad at Arlington. You, you can bury a spouse at Arlington as well. I went to see Kennedy, and he lives on a dirt road back in the woods in a shack. And I called Fenton Grainer uh, uh, before, the fellow I showed you the picture of, and said that he watched him kill the babies. I said, you're not gonna believe who I'm about to go see. And he said, who? And he said, take a gun, take a gun. He was still scared of this guy all these years later. And I show up at his cabin, long story short, I walk up to the door and out of the blackness inside, I hear a voice say, get in here. I open the door, creaks open, and there's a white sheeted bed. There's teddy bears all around the room. And on the white sheet is a brown revolver holster. No revolver. I walk down this hall, the immaculate room, he's sitting in an overstuffed chair with a blanket over him. And on the leather couch next to him is a black pistol holster. No pistol. Both hands are underneath the blanket. And I said, Mr. Kennedy, pleased to meet you. I've heard a lot about you. And I went to shake his hand, and the left hand never came out from under that blanket in three hours. He told me he had, right here is Colt Python. And he thought the bust was coming down. And I've been a journalist for 30 some years. I've been in two war zones. This is one of the scarier interviews I've ever done. This guy at 87 was still scary. And he's crazy. And I confronted him in a, I'm not gonna make the story short, in a uh, delicate way about the rape. And he denied, denied it. And uh, I'm not that brave to have really pushed him and said, dude, I know you did it. Not, not with that cold python there. <laughs> <laughs> Nick, how did, you, how did you come to understand these guys and these actions, and especially now we're thinking about today's wars, and you know, 
how did you come to understand how soldiers end up doing these things? And well, you know, it, it, it's something I, you know, I struggled with a lot. I had, a, I had an experience, something like yours, maybe a little less harrowing, but it was a, a soldier who had, uh, he confessed to, to one murder in the records. I had a sworn statement from him. But uh, fellow unit members said he'd, he'd kill a lot more people. And uh, one of them that I talked to, I mentioned I was going to go see him, and he said, you know, he's a stone cold killer. And I remember, you know, I, I, I just went up to his door cold and, and knocked, and you know, my heart was, was beating a mile a minute. And you know, the, what, what his fellow unit members had said about him, I expected you know, Rambo to answer the door. And of course, it was a, a 60 year old man who was uh, about my height, so not very tall. Uh, slightly doughy, nothing like what I was expecting. And you know, I was able to, to get in and, and, and talk to him. And I brought out the records and I showed them to him and uh, I stood with him and followed along as, as he read them. And you know, he, he got to the point where he confessed to shooting an old man point blank, uh, killing him and, and I asked him about that and he deflected and I asked him about some other allegations, and he pushed them off. And um, you know, uh, uh, eventually, I just kept trying to break him down on this. And he said, "Look, I killed a lot of people over there. How am I going to remember this one guy? It was that long ago?" So this is this is something you encounter. I mean, it was, um, and it, and I think actually it was the the Vietnamese who really uh, those interviews that really drove home. Uh, what the war was really about for me, because I would go to Vietnam with these stacks of documents, like the ones I brought to that veteran. I'd go to a village and uh, to ask about one particular atrocity, one horrific spasm of violence, and what the Vietnamese would tell me about was what it was like to live for 10 years under bombs and shells and helicopter gunships, and how they negotiated every aspect of their lives around the American war. Uh, and and that's what taught me that, that you know, what, I, what I needed to write wasn't a history of atrocities, wasn't what was just in the records. It was a, a history of that lived experience of the war. Let's go to questions from the audience here. I'm sure you have some. Um, go up to the microphone here in front of the room and uh, do say who you are for the record. Uh, is there anyone here who has a thought, a question? Yeah, all right. Which way do I face? Uh, oh, yeah. Okay, good. Hi, I'm Ari Goldman. I'm on the faculty here at the Graduate School of Journalism. I wonder, where were the journalists? Both these wars were very well covered, well documented. Some of our great journalists that we teach about and whose work we read covered um, World War II, covered Vietnam. Um, out of Vietnam, we have the My Lai Massacre. We know how that, um, that story was told by Seymour Hirsch and others. Um, but we, uh, what you're telling us, Nick, is that there were many, many, many Mile massacres um, that we didn't read about. And what you're telling us, Dale, is that there were many atrocities that American journalists and uh, European journalists didn't get to. Um, in your research, did you find any news reports that were valuable, or were you really uncovering things for the first time? In my case with World War II, there's so much good war of a mythology. You know, we didn't do anything wrong. There was one way to fight the war. And a lot of later writers are the ones I find. I mean, at the time, there was self imposed censorship. There was actual government censorship. You couldn't send your story without having a government person read it. So the journalists at the time had some excuse there. But it's later writers that I do hold to accountable to just raise questions about how the war was fought. Uh, it, it, it's not a monolithic good versus evil uh, uh, in terms of every decision that was made by us was not right. Um, and it wasn't good, for, wasn't good for my dad and it wasn't good for Mr. Mulligan how that, that battle was fought. I, I, I have personal stake in, the, in that issue. Um, so it's the, la the later writers I hold more accountable than I do the earlier guys. And I think, Nick, you found a lot more with the current journalists, more or less. Well, you know, there were a lot of fantastic uh, journalists in, in Vietnam who did great work, and uh, I devote one chapter to, to going through uh, 
uh, what I thought was a, a, a watershed year uh, in, in part of 1970 and 1971, where the reporting was especially good, and it looked like uh, you know the true nature of the war might have broken out, uh, especially due to a couple of Newsweek reporters named uh, Kevin Buckley, who was a faculty member here for many years, and uh, and Alex Shimkin, uh, but you know they they ran into problems with their magazine. There was, uh, and, and this was a problem that I, I heard in, in talking to uh, journalists that, you know, editors back in the States weren't keen on, on these stories a lot of the time. And uh, there was also self-censorship at work. Uh, reporters tell me that, uh, that they knew that, you know, if they brought these stories in, they, they weren't, you know, it, it wasn't going to be published. You, know, you mentioned the, the My Lai Massacre. Uh, I, I always think it's a, a, a great case in point because at the time the massacre was carried out, there were 500 to 800 uh, foreign correspondents in Vietnam. It was right in the wake of the 1968 Tet Offensive. Uh, but it, it took Seymour Hersh, a reporter who hadn't been to Vietnam, to break the story. When the reporters in Vietnam reported what went on at My Lai, uh, basically they took a, a US government press release and fed it right into the paper. Uh, it said that the Americans had killed 128 hardcore enemy troops at a cost of no U.S. lives and had turned up maybe three rifles, something like that. Uh, I mean, any journalist should take a look at that and say, how is that even possible? How could you kill 128 enemies, lose no one, and, uh, and, and have no weapons to show for it? It was farcical, but a lot of times press releases just got passed right in, into the paper's news. I, I remember seeing... Uh some interviews with journalists who had covered the war before me lie, saying in essence, well, we saw stuff like this all the time, but we didn't think it was a story. We didn't think it was news. It didn't occur to us to think of this as war crimes. And there is a sense in which it's kind of the shadow of Nuremberg and the shadow of the idea that Americans might be, commit war crimes, after all, has to creep up on folks, right? whether it's World War II vets or, or journalists or soldiers in Vietnam. Did either of you kind of find that, a kind of retrospective understanding? Well, again, with World War II, the mythology was, is so dominant, I can't say that I found anything yeah. like that. Yeah. Yeah, there, uh, I, I've heard what you were saying uh, you know, from, from a number of reporters, and this is something that, uh, that Neil Sheehan wrote about, in fact, in, in uh, it was in 1971, actually, in a, in a New York Times book review. He said that and when he was covering the war, that uh, he saw things that uh, later he recognized were atrocities when he, when he read about the loss of war. But he didn't know at the time that they were. He just assumed they were accepted uh, parts of the war and, uh, and, and didn't report on them as such. And there were, there were uh, a group of scholars, many of them here at Columbia, who cataloged over 3,000 instances of violations of the laws of war that were published in mainstream U.S. publications prior to My Lai. Newspapers and magazines, it was all there, but there was never any context. The journalists didn't know what they were looking at. They didn't realize that the crimes that they were putting in the paper were the same things that, uh, that the Nazis and, uh, and, the, and the Japanese had been prosecuted for after the war. It just, they didn't put the two together. And also racism was a factor. Um, the Japanese were portrayed, you know, with, you know, buck teeth, and there's been many books written about that, and that's one of the reasons why fewer Japanese prisoners were taken. And I don't think the public uh, really cared. And General Shepard, the, the Marine General of my father's unit, was quoted in documents that I know, found over here at uh, uh, Columbia's library, saying that he, fe he felt that the German soldier had more value than the Japanese soldier's life. So there, was a, there was a rampant racism behind all of it in the country, not just among the reporters or, or the, the army or the military. Yeah. Other, and other questions from the floor? Just come up to the mic. I'll kind of keep it going, but please, good, come. And again, just say who you are and for, the, for the record. Um, all right, hello, my name is Jeff Tyson. I'm a student here at the journalism school. Um, I wonder what the, the response to your books have been. Have, has there been any veterans that you've interviewed who have read the book or family members? Um, and what, what have they had to, to say about it? Just last week I was in Los Angeles and I saw Tom Price, who's one of the 12 men I, I document. We had a wonderful reunion and lunch. He loves the book. Uh, I've talked to several others on the phone. But what's surprising to me is how, 
Every day I'm getting emails and letters from the children of World War II vets saying, I understand my father now. Uh, and I'm trying, so far I've been able to keep up with answering each one. Um, I'm also hearing from Vietnam vets. The Vietnam vets really relate to the World War II guys in the Pacific Theater. Uh, I was on a, a radio show with two Vietnam War vets in Portland, Oregon, and um, they said, you're the first World War II book we've had on. But, you know, this, is, this gets with the same kind of thing. And the other, the last group I'm hearing from, I'm hearing from some Iraq and Afghanistan vets who are relating to the book very strongly, uh, which is very gratifying to me because I think to blast concussion injury, traumatic brain injury, it's the same from each war. And what these vets are dealing with are what my father had to deal with. But hopefully today, and we, we, I don't care what anybody's politics are, we owe taking care of them. Uh, and I hope it just raises awareness that we have to take care of these soldiers today. And hearing from them and hearing that they're relating to this story, that was reason enough for me to do the book. You've gotten those long emails too, haven't you? Yeah, yeah I've had much the same experience. Uh, you know, I've, I've heard from from men who were in the book, but uh, I've heard from, from so many more uh, who I, I didn't know before, Vietnam veterans who have gotten in touch to say that they felt uh, validated by the book, that they were finally, you know, they'd, they'd come home and either they felt they weren't able to tell what they'd seen, or when they did, they said that they were, uh, they were called liars or said that, uh, you know, you must be exaggerating this. And, uh, you know, email after email, guys would just tell me, you know, finally, I have the evidence. Finally, I know it wasn't just my unit. Finally, uh, I'm able to point to this and say, look, this is, this is what I've been trying to tell you for the last 40 years. And it's, I mean, it's exceptionally gratifying uh, to get the responses like that. And, and I've also heard from, from the children of, of veterans the same types of things where they said, you know, there was this darkness that surrounded my father. I never knew why he acted the way he did. I asked about the war and he said, you know, if you weren't there, you could never know. And, uh, and, and they said that, you know, now I, I, I read the book and understand. I know what he, he went through. Uh, and, it, and it was, I think, uh, a chance for them to, to heal and come to grips uh, with, with their, their childhoods and, and what they've been living with as, as the uh, children of veterans. I got, I got one of those emails today uh, from someone who said he's a Vietnam vet and who, who seemed to be struggling a little bit. Uh, on the one hand, uh, applauding uh, the search for the truth about, um, about atrocity and clearly very uh, critical of American military policy in Vietnam, of the choices that uh, the Pentagon had made and of the conditions that allowed atrocities to happen. At the same time saying, uh, well, but this wasn't typical of my experience and wasn't typical of most combat soldiers that I know. What do you say to those guys who ask, who put it that way? Well, you know, I, I try to take pains in the, in the book to uh, make it clear that I'm, I'm certainly not saying that all U.S. troops uh, were murderers or that uh, all units committed these micro-level atrocities, uh, you know, face-to-face -face massacres, murders, that type of thing. Uh, you know, what I, what I try and really drive home in Kill Anything That Moves is that, uh, you know, what, what killed most Vietnamese wasn't, you know, a, a My Lai style massacre. This wasn't what, what took most lives. There's only so much killing a, a squad or a platoon or a you know, full company can do. Uh, most Vietnamese, and uh, the best estimates we have are two million Vietnamese civilians were killed. A uh, conservative estimate would be five million wounded. Uh, what, what killed and wounded these people was heavy firepower. Uh, saturation bombing in the countryside, uh, artillery shelling across the free fire zones that I mentioned, which included uh, heavily populated villages, helicopter gunships that, uh, that basically uh, hunted people uh, and, and shot those who were taking evasive action, is what it was called. That's basically anyone who ran from a, from a helicopter with a, with a door gunner who had a, a machine gun trained on them. It's very hard to stand still when, uh, when you're facing that, that type of technology. Uh, so this is, uh, it's, it's what I try and make clear. I know that, that some veterans uh, take exception and they, they feel that uh, they're being smeared in some way. But I, I really try and tell a, a nuanced story. And, you know, really I'm, I'm, I'm working from the records. I'm working from uh, interviews and conversations with hundreds of Vietnam veterans. Uh, 
this is the, the story of the war as they saw it, and I'm just telling what, what they told me. Dale, have you gotten any uh, feedback from people who feel you are knocking down, I mean, you talk about it as a myth, but who, who are knocking down the image of the World War II soldier? People don't like <clears throat> myths shattered. They, it's, it's, it doesn't fit their, their worldview, their paradigm, but I took great pains. The book quotes each man. Now, I didn't ask, I don't know what their politics are, uh, and I didn't ask this question, but to a man, everybody I talked to, I met with, was against the war in Iraq and Afghanistan. And these are not liberal guys. <laughs> They're like my dad. They're rather conservative. As a matter of fact, I felt I was talking to my dad every time I talked to them. And uh, They would bring this up. And Mr. Price, who I just saw last week, his grandson, he, he basically helped raise his grandson. And his grandson worships Mr. Price. And when 9-11 happened, the grandson said, I'm going to go join. I'm going to join. And Mr. Price sat him down and said, you don't want to go. He says, don't go. Um, my dad, I found out after, the guy who bought my dad's business, I was in Cleveland in 2011 for the last interviews for the book, and he said, you know, your dad trained me for three months, and he said, one time we were talking about the war, and he said, he looked at me and said, if there's a war, I'm driving my sons to Canada. Uh, my dad would never have told me that. Uh, <laughs> so they were anti-war. So some people have taken issue with the fact that I have an anti-war agenda, uh, one interviewer from the BBC said, what's your position on war? I said, I, well, I, I'm not, who's pro-war? I said, I think it's clear. No, she says, it's not. They're anti-war to a man. So um, if anybody has a beef with my book, they have a beef with the, guy, the veterans. Other, oh yeah, come, come on up to the mic. I want to raise a slightly different kind of question. I was in the Marine Corps for three and a half years, uh, just at the end of the uh, Korean War, and we were training troops. And uh, the whole approach was uh, discipline on the one hand and training on the other, repeated and repeated and repeated until it would finally sink in and people could act, could respond under great stress automatically in the way they'd been trained. Now that, that was the, I was an officer in the Marine Corps and that was what we thought we were doing. <laughs> so what you're talking about is a terrible indictment of the military and I accept exactly what you're saying because I know from my own experience that this is what happens. But can you imagine uh, dealing with young kids now? We're talking about, uh, you know, in the Second World War, some of these people lied about their ages. We had 15-year-olds and 16-year-olds who were... Some of the guys in my dad's company were 16. Right, who had no world experience, uh, nothing behind them, and they were confronted with this. Can you imagine the idea that I give about where we were, <laughs> what the Marine approach to it, working with young kids, or is it just a, an impossibility? Well, the, some of the guys told me about the, my dad talked about boot camp and how you need discipline on the line. And, and, you know, and when you're 16 or 18 like my dad was, you know, you, you're very malleable at that point. Um, but they were kids. You look at the pictures of these guys, I mean, my, my dad was just a, a child, barely, just out of childhood. And he's over there, and he grew up in that horrible environment. I didn't get into it when I showed those pictures. Eight people lived in a two-room house he grew up in. It was the Great Depression. There was no food many times. Um, and he was thrown into that milieu. As I say, I, I'm just surprised he's as normal as he was. I don't know how I would have handled it at that age. How did you understand the, 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 the sort of the, the training versus, well, where does, that, where does it fit in, training, discipline, war crimes? How does it all fit together? Well, uh, you know, basic training boot camp is something that, uh, you know, every veteran I talked to came to on their own. They would talk about it because they would say again and again how this was, the, the, as soon as they got to boot camp, things were drilled into them, chanting, kill, 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 over and over again. Uh, the spirit of the bayonet, they have to recite these things. And I, I talked to uh, 
numerous veterans who told me that, you know, they didn't become quite a, a robot, uh, and, uh, but, but it, it got to close to that level where they were so primed uh, to kill that they were ready when they got to Vietnam. And of course, this serves you well uh, in, in combat if you're, you're facing off in some World War I type battle where you're, you're, uh, there, there's a uniformed enemy a, across the line. Uh, but you know, they, were, they were sent to fight uh, a guerrilla war in villages filled with women and children, and they were given no training along these lines. Uh, in fact, uh, often they would tell me that their training was infused with, with racism. Uh, there was a shorthand in Vietnam called the MGR, or the Mir Guk Rule. The idea was that the Vietnamese weren't uh, real people. They were subhuman, mere gooks who would be abused or killed at will. And they said that from the moment they got to boot camp, this was, this was part of the process, that uh, you don't call them uh, Vietnamese. You call them gooks or dinks, slants, slopes, anything to dehumanize them, anything to make it easier to kill. And a lot of the men I talked to said that it, it really worked, even uh, minority uh, soldiers. They said that they knew that this was the same, it was, it was the same as the slurs that they heard back home, but they were steeped in this environment and they, they felt it almost you know, took over their, their psyche. Well, one, one thing that I find fascinating with my dad was, my dad had that business and he sold Nachi cutting tools in the early 70s, Japanese made, and the, and the Japanese rep, reps were going to come and talk about selling the tools. He, we would buff the names up as people, it was still anti-Japanese sentiment. Mm -hmm. And I said, Dad, isn't it kind of weird these, these, these representatives are going to come? And he, says, and he said this many times, they were doing what they were told, I was doing what I was told. He didn't make it personal. Um, and he wasn't a, you know, a liberal progressive guy, but it was just, so he dealt with the Japanese. But not every guy, like Frank Palmasani, he still, he said, I wish I could have killed more. So some soldiers, I, it was probably the same in Vietnam, personified the enemy where others just made it, this was, hey, we're all playing in our roles. Another question from, from the room? Anybody? Um, I, if not, I, I have a, a question for both of you. Maybe and maybe we'll, we'll sort of end here. Um, you've both, in your different ways, taken us back to American wars of the past um, and to their impact on civilians, on soldiers, and unto the generations. Um, but both of you are working on these books in the shadow of a decade of war here. Um, as um, you're working on these books as America is winding down but uh, extricating itself uh, sort of from Iraq and perhaps preparing to extricate itself sort of from Afghanistan. Um, how was your thinking about today's wars and your work on these books connected, bound up? How have you thought about it? Well, you know, uh, you know I, I, I hope that, uh, that Kill Anything That Moves would have uh, resonance uh, because of, of the, the wars that are, that are ongoing. You know, America's been involved in, in serial conflicts in, uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan and, and the semi-covert campaigns in, in Pakistan and Somalia and Yemen. And, uh, you know, I, I felt that, you know, if, if Americans are called upon to send their uh, brothers and sisters and, and sons and daughters to, uh, to war, then the American people should, should know what it's like for the, uh, the, the sons and daughters and, and brothers and sisters of, of people overseas, the civilians who live with war every day. And, uh, and, and that's what I've tried to provide a glimpse of, uh, and, and I, I hope it can be of, of some service uh, as, we, as we think about today's wars. And I think, um, tied off of that, uh, here at home, Captain Frank Hagler, who's the captain of my father's company, I found him. When I found him in Southern California, he had two acres of property, and at one point he had a Sherman tank and a Japanese tank, and his basement had thousands of items, including the helmet of Lieutenant Poussard from my dad's company, with a bullet hole through it, and the sniper's, Japanese sniper's helmet who killed him. I mean, obsessed with the war, but what he also was obsessed with was the survivors. He wrote to the family members of all the dead for years, and he had the trove of letters he shared with me, including to Mr. Mulligan's grandfather. And so Captain Hagler was, uh, was not anti-war by any means, I mean, but he told me, he said, I'm not anti-war, but he said, when you die, 
and I saw many men die in my company, he said, it's over for you. But he says, I, you know, I've learned from corresponding it never ends for the survivors. And so the wars go on in the homes. And as I found, it went on in my home in terms of the, my father's blast concussion injury, his rage, it affected how we grew up. So wars don't end when the shooting stops. They go on and on. And so I think Captain Hagler's message to me, and I quote him in the book, was if we thought about that before we went to war, we'd, we'd go to war less often. And this is, again, this is a, not an anti-war guy at all. Well, let's leave it there. Um, thank you, Dale and Nick. Thank for you. Thank your you. books, your research, and your generosity here. Uh, thank all of you. Thank you, C-SPAN. Um, www.dartcenter.org for anyone who wants to know more about what we do. Um, thanks also to the Ridenauer Prize of the Nation Institute, which co-sponsored this, helped promote it a little bit, and which gave Nick Terse a very nice award for his work. Um, there is material about the Dart Center and books, books to buy and get signed as the staff of the Dart Center is frantically pointing to me. There are books at the back table. Please buy them. Please get them signed. Please support great journalism and great writing. Thank you. <laughs>